just said. So, all right, I'll make now it, we can get started. All right, I'll make it even briefer. So, good afternoon, everybody. Kurt Wassersug, work for a company called Cy, uh, Sepio Cyber, who developed a security tool that uses a data source that no one's ever seen before. What we do is focus on the existence of hardware and not what the hardware is doing. We'll talk more about this. All this is done is by using a, a layer one as the data source. So, you know, again, thank you very much for your time. I know it's late in the day. I understand this is a technical discussion. We will keep it to that. But as we go through this, at least in the beginning, what I'm gonna do is set the stage on why layer one is important and needed to be added to the existing security stack. You know, <laughs> we're gonna to discuss today the challenges in visibility from a security perspective and truly how to solve that, really close that visibility gap using layer one. In short, what we talk about is it's giving you the ability to see what you've been missing. So as we jump into this, and again, we all know this, enterprises face an incredibly difficult challenge related to cybersecurity. We're constantly fighting battles since computers existed. We face nation states, bad actors, hacking group, individual optimistic people, and throughout time, what we've done is develop security solutions to defend our infrastructure and protect our IP. The challenge is security solutions are developed based on the new types of attacks, starting from the 80s all the way to the 2020s. Truly, it's a reactive approach. I've been in the cybersecurity field for about 20 years, uh, you know, on the offense and defensive side, on the vendor side, plus the, 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 the corporate side. And it's always been a reactive approach, meaning, when we identify a new threat or a new behavior, we're developing a tool to stop that. And truthfully, the current solutions today, they're all using network traffic as the data source, whether I'm doing deep pack inspection, behavioral analysis, net flow, et cetera. Again, I think we all understand that, but what happens is, and if I represent this in the, in the OSI model, you know, we have all of these solutions on the right. It's a reactive approach. We have firewall, sandboxes, using NetFlow, XDR, Honeypots, Nmap, all of that, with a laundry list of what's there. Now, I'm not saying that these solutions are not good. Truly, it's a defense in depth approach and everything is needed. But what we do know is that attackers take or find the path of least resistance, whether they're at the layer two, layer three and four, the, the, the network layer, uh, uh, five through seven at the application, they're looking for the path of least resistance. There's thousands of vendors that are coming up with products to defend against these things. And again, it's all based on traffic. The challenge, what we've seen is layer one has always been left unattended. Why is that? Because traffic doesn't exist at layer one. We'll talk more about that. So what we see is attackers are gaining more and more access from a hardware perspective. And we'll talk more about that. Here's a great example. Path of least resistance. I don't know if there's any pen testers in the audience, but you, know, you look on the things on the right, these are all traditional pen testing tools. I've been involved with red teams with pen testing. And truly what we did is I'm gonna attack the network first. If I can't get in, I'm gonna attack the application layer second. If I can't get in there, I'm gonna buy one of these off of Hack5, which is just a website that you can buy it off of for less than $100 and I'm gonna plug it into your network. You know, what scares me the most about this is this website, Hack5, you guys can all go to it. You can buy any of these tools on there. But shocking enough, some of them are sold out. Why are they sold out? I don't think there's enough pen testers in the world or in the country to actually buy these. Even last year, the federal government came down on Hack5 to say you cannot export these devices outside of the country. Again, it's finding that path of least resistance. And truly, it's hard to do that from a traffic perspective. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. So as we go into this, you know, why do we need to extend visibility in the physical layer? I'm going to talk about three high-level use cases. And truthfully, it's still a problem that hasn't been solved for with traffic-based solutions. If we look at the, the use case on the left, the ICSIA tap, called a Netgear switch, they're Mac list devices, they're unknown assets. We can't see them based on traffic using Mac solutions. Even if we get into 802.1x, we can talk more about that. Whether I'm looking at shadow IT or devices that are unknown to NAC solutions, I can't see them. But when you look at layer one, they have a digital existence. We'll talk more about that, but this is fundamentally what we're looking at is that digital existence. 
If I look at the one in the middle, a passive man in the middle attack. Any of these solutions out or tools out there, this one is pretty nefarious. It's a proxy cast that has a 3G modem. Imagine this being stuck between a, a printer and a switch and anything that's sent to the printer gets exfiltrated out over this 3G modem. Um, you know, again, passive solutions, there's no behavior. There's, there's no packets that you can monitor. It's not doing anything, it's passive in nature, but because it has a digital existence, layer one can find this. And again, if I pick on the one on the right, on the call it supply chain, call it an insider threat. When we talk about EDR solutions, CrowdStrike, Carbon Black, all the ones that are out there, what they use is vendor ID and product ID to whitelist or blacklist, meaning that Microsoft mouse is gonna use a vendor ID and product ID and it's gonna say, I'm this. Well, in security, as we all know, it's trust, but verify. So I need to verify that truly that device is what it is. Now, with this one, supply chain or insider threat, embedded with a Raspberry Pi device, it essentially has a digital existence. So using layer one can decipher the difference between truly a Microsoft mouse or something that has been manipulated. All right, so let's jump into the how this works. Hopefully that is the least amount of sales things that I can talk about, but it was truly just to set the stage on how this works. All right. So how does layer one work? The best analogy I can give you is to a human being. Think about layer one as a, a physical fingerprint of a device. Every single device, whether it's an IT device, an IoT device, an OT device, an IMOT device, an IIoT device, you know, all that alphabet soup, everything has a physical fingerprint. And again, if I equate that to a human being, we know every human being has their own unique fingerprints. In fact, every finger is different. Truly every asset, IT, OT, or IOT, that's plugged into a network has its own physical fingerprint. That fingerprint is made up of electronic characteristics, calm analog signals. You know, if I take one analog signal like voltage, that's like one squiggly line on my finger. It's not going to tell me who it is or who I am or what the device is. But if I take voltage, impedance, ampage, current, all of these analog signals, when I put them together, just as the fingerprint, all the squiggly lines you put together, grab all those analog signals and put them together, that creates that unique fingerprint for that device. So a Cisco IP camera is going to have a different analog signals different that make up that fingerprint that's different than an HP camera or a peripheral Microsoft mouse is different than a logic tech mouse. Any network device, it will be different based on the analog signals. And this is what layer one is doing. It's grabbing all of the analog signals from, we'll talk about where it is from the network or the endpoints to understand three things. And we'll talk about what those three things are. All right, so let's talk about how this works. I think we all understand that fundamentally the high level concept of a fingerprint using those analog signals. So when we think about putting this in play, truthfully, it's a three-step process. The first step is to determine the presence of a device. Again, when we talk about traffic-based solutions, mac -less solutions, NAC solutions can't see it. Passive devices, behavioral network, behavioral analysis, any type of passive solution will any type of passive solution will hot fly under the radar. So the goal in security, if we think about visibility, which is inversely proportional to risk, meaning the greater the visibility, I can ultimately reduce my risk. And how do we do that? First step is to find everything on the network. So using layer one, what we're looking for is the digital existence of that device. You can do it on the network side, you can do it on the endpoint side. I'll talk about both, but essentially it's the same process. So step one, what we do using layer one is we grab all of those analog signals off the switch. It's passive in nature. It's a read only access to the switch, which is actually doing a show command, which is looking for those analog signals, electronic characteristics. You know, a lot of people think that they don't exist on the switch, but truthfully, switches use them for load balancing. Granted, Switches, uh, switches do a lot more than just load bouncing. We use a lot more other information for load bouncing. But the point is, is these electronic signals, these analog components, they exist on the switch. So to fundamentally find the digital existence, all you need to do is look for the analog signals. Obviously the proof's in the pudding on how to do it, 
but what we're doing is show commands to extract that information. The same thing on the endpoint side, and there's a lot of different options. You can put an agent on it. We understand that people are agent adverse, so you can do agentless. We understand people don't want anything on there. So then you can do session-based. Basically, when you're logging into a Zscale or a Citrix, you know, think about adding another script to look for physical layer one information. So again, what we're doing is grabbing the physical layer one information, the analog signals, to determine the presence of a device. Once we see the signals, we know a device exists. So that's step one, determine the presence of every device. Now, the beauty of layer one, you can't hide from it. Because anytime you plug something in, you've now just created an analog signal of that device on the network, whether it's on the switch or whether it's on the endpoint itself. So you can't hide from layer one. So step two is to determine what that device is. So as we collect all the fingerprints from the network or the endpoint side, we match it. It has to be matched against a known set of data. So think about, we have a database that has over 100 million electronic fingerprints. So we know the known, we know the unknown, we know the good, we know the bad. So as we get these called gold standard fingerprints, we know what that device is. So as I grab those analog signals off the switch and it's telling me one thing, let's say based on the MAC address, and I match that against the known knowledge base, I know that there's a gap because those electronic signals are not matching anymore. So I know fundamentally that device is not what it's telling me is. So that's step two, finding what that device is. Since we subsequently know what the device is, we also understand what hardware is there, what unknown devices, what unmanaged devices, potentially what device vulnerabilities on there, what manipulated devices. And all of this information allows you to enforce policies based on the hardware aspect. And again, if we think about it, I'm going to go back to the beginning is when I talked about, you know, security has always been reactive. What is the device doing? What behavior is it letting off? Who is it talking to? What service is it using? It's after the fact. What we need to do is move that to the front end to say, what is the device? First and foremost, let's find out what that device says. All right. So again, three-step process. Find the analog signals to determine that the device, the device exists on the network of the endpoint. Match it against a known knowledge base to determine if that device is saying what it is or what that device is. And subsequently, share associated risks, unmanaged devices, unknown devices, enforce policy. So let me kind of actually put this into the real world examples here. All right. So I'm going to ask you, can you spot the difference? But I'm going to save you it because... These pictures are exactly alike. I made these slide. So the printer on the left and the printer on the right, exactly the same. The elevator is supposed to represent an IoT device, but the elevator on the left, the elevator on the right, exactly the same. The, the, the Microsoft mouse is exactly the same. The keyboards are exactly the same. I could put any hardware asset. I could put an OT asset. I could put a medical asset. It doesn't matter or uh, any device possible. It would be the same. So from a naked eye, they look exactly alike. All right. So let's add traffic, Wireshark, into this. Again, I know it's very hard to see, but trust me when I tell you, you're not going to be able to find the differences in traffic based on this device, based on these devices, because the, they they're fly under the radar, can't see them with traffic. But let's now take layer one and see what it looks like. So as you can see here, here's a printer that has a Raspberry Pi embedded into it. Now, keep in mind, I don't know if everybody's familiar with the Raspberry Pi is. It's a great device. It's not always nefarious. They're used in signage boards. They're actually used in COVID breathing machines. They're fantastic. However, the nefarious part is I could program a Raspberry Pi with the same MAC address of that printer itself, which is what was done in this case. So again, if a NAC solution, we'll see that's the MAC address. Yep, that's fine. I'm going to, it's whitelisted. I'm going to let it in. Trust, but verify. Again, using layer one, as you can see at the bottom, this is what the normal, the gold standard of that printer or that elevator or any device itself would have, those analog signals, what it should be. But when you look on the left side, you can see all the analog signals are skewed a little bit. What that means is it's truly not the printer or the IoT device or the OT device or the peripheral device. 
what we're saying is using this layer one truly gives you the differentiators between what it's saying is and what it truly is, or looking for devices that fly under the radar, where in this case, on this side, wouldn't exist at all because you can't see it in traffic, but we see it in layer one. The same thing on the peripheral side, and truly this, what scares me the most here, this is a regular keyboard. This is a, you can see the size of it. It is a, uh, a, a, key, a keystroke logger that is wireless. Uh, it was placed inside of a keyboard. And again, it was found because the VIN PID was exactly the same, but it was found because the analog signals changed. Those electronic characteristics are now different than what that device should be. So let's kind of moving on here. Um, you know, I, 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 in, the, in the years that I've been doing this, my philosophy, and I've said this early, is we need solutions have to work together. They have to feed each other. They have to learn from each other. Using layer one is not another tool. It's just the data set. It's a data set like traffic is, peak caps, behavioral analysis, deep packet inspection, flow analysis. It doesn't matter. Add layer one into that. And what you're able to do with layer one is just build that data set into your existing workflows, your existing processes. For example, CMDBs, we all know that's a static thing, uh, a moment in time snapshot when you take it, generally put it in a, a, an Excel document. Yeah, there's a lot of other solutions out there that keep your things updated, or you can hire a company to crawl around and see everything. But wouldn't it be great to see, hey, within the past 24 hours, what net new devices that were connected to my network? And oh, by the way, let me feed that into my CMDB. Maybe they're, the, they're devices that are out of band or Mac-less devices, things that can't be seen. If I tie it to zero trust, you know, zero trust is a, it's a nirvana, which we will ultimately get to, but basically fundamentally, it's not trusting anything, the person, the, the, the machine, the peripheral, anything on there. But sometimes the challenge with zero trust or VPNs or anything like that is they're looking at the users, MFA, service levels, patch levels on the machine, but it never goes down to the peripheral. So again, tie that back into that, that wire, that keyboard that, that had that, uh, that, that Wi-Fi keylogger in it is we can't see that. So adding layer one into zero trust is incredibly important because now you're verifying down to the, call it first mile on entry. Micro segmentation, you know, micro segmentation, Illumino, Gardecore, all those ones that are out there, if they don't see it, you can't really achieve 100% micro segmentation. So the first step is to feed layer one into those solutions as an added data source. Talk about compliance, you know, whether it's section 889 of NDAA, the challenge with that is talking about uh, certain Chinese telecommunication equipment that's not allowed in the federal government or contractors for the ghetto Roman. My feeling it's gonna to move to commercial, but it's really hard to find those types of devices. We can buy Chinese uh, cameras and I can send them to Texas, rebrand them to say made in the Texas. It's a US product at that point in time, but truly that fingerprint, those analog signals will still represent that Xiaomi or some other uh, 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 section 889 unapproved device. Again, tying that into, you know, even layer one with your existing NAC solutions. NAC solutions are great. I spent, I think every, I did a stint at Cisco. I think a lot of people do a stint at Cisco. And, you know, Cisco ICE is great, whether you have it, use it for wired, wireless, using 802.1x. But as you see with that Raspberry Pi, I can spoof a MAC address, or I can have a device that's MACless. Again, what we're doing is enhancing that visibility, adding layer one into your NAC. And finally, if we think about existing workflows, existing process, you know, feed layer one information into your SOAR to take action into something, put it in your ticketing system to take action, put it in your SIM, feed all of the data. You know, however you utilize the information, that's up to the individual, but build layer one or I'm sorry, I should say add layer one into your existing security stack because now it allows you to feed multiple use cases that you may not have been able to see with, uh, with, 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 with traditional security solutions. Again, it's layer one we talk about is see what you've been missing. So guys, that's all I want. Go ahead. Was there a question? 
Yeah, so I think, or at least my driving question is, okay, I agree with it, so how? Yep. How are you collecting the data and what is, how, how do you alert on signals? Yeah, okay, that's a great example. So let me go back to here. So the collection of data, let's talk about on the network side. So the, the, all you need to do is basically you connect to the switch via SSH, it's read only, and all you're doing is a show command to extract the electronic signals, those analog signals. From there, you fundamentally know what it is. So now, since we know what the device following that process, this is where we're collecting it from. So if we tie it back into you know, this scenario, let's say I see uh, shadow IT detection, meaning I see, uh, I see a Netgear switch that's there that nobody knows about for shadow IT. I can alert that, hey, there's an unmanaged switch because my layer one information is showing this information. I can put it into a SIM to do an alert. I can send information to the, the SOC team and MSSP alert. Maybe that there's a spoof device, meaning let's say I see a Raspberry Pi spoofing a Dell XPS. I'm not saying the Raspberry Pis are bad, but anything that's spoofing another device, probably something's wrong. So if I do see something that's saying it's a Dell XPS, truly it's a Raspberry Pi, again, I could feed it to the SIM for an alert. I can feed it into the SOAR application to take control. Maybe you want to actually put it in your NAC solution and quarantine that, move it to a quarantine VLAN. So there's so many different use cases on how to use it. It's depending on, Robert, it's depending on what your existing process is on how you do, see the alert and how you take action. Okay. So that implies that you've got a managed switch at every location, every port in your, in your zone, right? And that that managed switch isn't feeding to any downstream unmanaged switches. Um, like if, I don't know, my developers happen to have an unmanaged switch at their desk. That's gonna got hide all of their stuff, right? And not every managed switch is gonna support per port voltage levels, you know, unless you're using SFT going directly to every node in the building. Uh, that would be really expensive and really tough. Um, I mean, that, that kind of, that in and of itself seems like a pretty big deployment issue if you're not running that switch configuration at every node. I know what the old Cisco catalysts definitely will give you four port, per port voltage on their like 48 ports. So did you did you hear the question completely? I I, I think so. So the the I understand what you're saying. So if we take the catalyst switches, the Juniper switches, Arista switches, Meraki, whatever it is, all of the ports have that analog signals that we can read from. Obviously, it has to be a, a, a 20 year old switch may not have layer one information on it. So, but we do see it now to answer your question about the downstream. So, like a, let's say a Netgear switch plugged into a port, we will actually see that unmanaged switch. We'll show you that in the UI. So, we can see the unmanaged switch, but I also may see, hey, there's four IP addresses that are connected to within that one port. What does that tell me? It's either an IP phone that has something connected to it, or it's an unmanaged switch that has multiple devices to it. So there's a lot of ways to do it, but truly what we're doing is the access switches where we're collecting that information. Seems like you'd have to have everything upstream of the access switches too. Otherwise somebody could put something in line and then wouldn't be able to see any of that stuff either. So I, I'm not sure I heard that one. Gal, did you hear that question? Uh, it just means that you'd have to do a, a Seems like you couldn't just do the access switches. You'd have to do the four switches too, reading down to the access switches because you'd never, never have any visibility at that layer. If somebody pops a, something in line on my gateway, I feel like I really want to know that before it gets to an access switch. So the question is really about being able to act, know that what's getting put on the, on the core switch rather than, or, or you'd have to 
you need visibility everywhere. That's yeah, you need engine. visibility everywhere, not just at your access layer, but to your core switches as well as your access layers. Is that is that yeah, accurate? I think so. It just seems like any any place you have a dark spot, now you don't know what's going on. Be it upstream or downstream of a of another switch. At least the way I'm thinking about it, like you've got a you know graph of switches going on upstream, downstream, managed, unmanaged. If you have an unmanaged switch anywhere in your network, all of a sudden, this is the, the nasty dark place and there could be an entire separate network going downstream of there. Oh no, just know there's traffic flowing from there and you're back to layer two on up. You know, that you should be able to tell, be able to tell that there's a um, You have now signed on to never being able to use a managed switch on your network. You were signed on to never being able to use an unmanaged switch. Is that what you're yeah. saying? Right. If you're using something like this, you can't ever sign on to use an unmanaged switch okay. because you're on the voltage levels coming from the layers from the from the managed switch. Right. Well, no, you would be able to use it. The question is, do you want to find it? Oh, I don't care if I can find that. I just care if I can find anything attached to it, which sounds like I can't. So I guess the, the, at the root level, the question really is, is that if the switch is unmanaged or what we run into a lot of times with some of the companies, if you're a small tier company that can't afford the latest equipment, so you, instead you're buying your equipment on eBay, right? You're, and so, and maybe we need to target maybe what, what, the, what we're looking at. But if you're a small tier company, is you buying your stuff on eBay and you've got the latest, you know, Cisco 1900, Catalyst 1900 that's still running some legacy hardware, that's not good. This may not be a good fit for that organization. Is that an accurate statement? That is an accurate statement. I mean, tr tr truly, it has to support layer one on that switch. If it doesn't, no, we cannot read it. That's correct. Okay. So okay. Majority... Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, the scenario I was thinking was more, I'm in a medium-sized company. I have my nice switch rack set up in my main distribution frame. They're all nice and shiny and can read voltage levels and all that good stuff. And, you know, I lease my building from, you know, whoever, and uh, they do all the wiring. So, of course, eventually I hire enough people that all of a sudden I have not enough drops going from the main distribution center to there. Normally at that point, it's easy, right? Somebody goes out to Best Buy, they buy a switch and they say, okay, you're a guy, you're now gonna split out the two and we're good. Now all of a sudden you're saying, I can't do that because- No, 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 yeah, no, no, and I apologize. You can do that. I mean, look, we're not gonna, we're gonna alert that it's there. We're not gonna stop it. The stopping is up to you because there are maybe practical use cases where you need those those net gear switches in there to actually get more drops and, and all of that stuff. We're not okay. going to prevent it. No, I, I get that. I guess what I'm saying is now anything connected to that switch, I lose complete visibility. on. Only if you want to depend on this for visibility. I mean, you have yeah, to subscribe. Sure. That's the deal, right? If you're going to subscribe to this type of technology, you right. have to go in understanding what it requires at its base level. It's the same thing with NAC. It's the same thing with anything sure. else. There's a certain, there's a certain, there's a certain, you got to be this tall to ride the rock, yep. right? Absolutely. So, so you just have to know that going in that in order to be able to subscribe to this, you're going to have to meet this criteria to be able to be able to use this as a, That's as, a yeah. as, as a visibility point. Sure. And I, 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 mediations around, around areas we want to yeah, you use other mitigation control. factors. Right, right. We access can't, control. We can't see this, so we're going to layer in something else. Yeah. That. I, I right. think okay, physical visibility from here on down. Now we don't know. Right. It, yeah. It, you know, there could be two developers hooked in here, or there could be five Raspberry Pis, or somebody could have run in another crazy 48 port switch, and now half the company could be running off this thing. We don't know. Right. Like if you manage the computers on it, 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 it truly really come. Okay, so we, we have some visibility. It's not. Oh, yeah. sure, sure. I guess I should have told you that like this will devolve quickly. <laughs> this, this is awesome. I mean, you know, really, truly, I mean, I always say it this way. What is your level of risk you're, you're willing to take? 
you know, your propensity to risk. And, and there are some organizations that say, hey, I need these Netgear switches. I need all of this. I'm okay with having them in there. There are other organizations saying, no, we don't want that. We need full control, full visibility. So, but you're right, it comes down to is, what is the risk you're willing to accept? And is it a risk to your organization? Right. And so, and, and just so that you understand, this is not, we just look at the technology and just kind of chat about it. So yeah. it's, it's not, it's just something for us to kind of. Believe me, I love these questions. So let's do this. We have, I, I, let's keep the questions going. Maybe what we do is just show you how some of the attack scenarios look and what you would see in that. So, so Gal, do you want to uh, just, just bring up, you know, just quickly on the asset inventory, then jump into the peripheral side and then, and then the network side, but guys, yeah. these are, th these are all great questions and really do appreciate them. Rob, I've got one. Okay. So screen. fingerprinting electronic signals like layer one. Um, I'm thinking about use cases where, especially today, like people are buying things, supply chains compromised, and you're buying things that aren't malicious, but are potentially fraudulent. Like you buy, yes. a, buy a charger pack that you, you notice it's really light, you open it up and it's a tiny circuit in there. That's decided. That and broken or failing devices, can you, oh. you detect, can you detect that all of a sudden my switch is pulling voltage and you can flag that as anomaly? And the text potentially failing hardware device. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. So, what about a failing switch or a failing piece of equipment, as opposed like it was good today, and as it begins to fail, that 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 electronic signature is going to begin to devolve a bit. So now it's going to be picked up as as fraudulent. So how do you manage that? I I will answer that. So the technology, what we do. Uh, in that cases, uh, and that's like what I find is like the genius part of it. We don't take just one example, like one fingerprint, and that's it. We tell you what it is. Eventually, what we do, we took uh, we take several examples of the physical information, and what we make the fingerprint from is from the ratio between the the fingerprint, like the data and the ratio. So if you have like 40 cable, 40 switch, the ratio with the device, it will remain the same. So if you take several examples, maybe the base data will be changed, but still it will keep the, you know, the, the data will be dirty on all the tests. And this is how we can filter like, you know, long cables or some, uh, uh, if someone like have like power source next to the switch, it affects as well. But since it all gets dirty, we know to filter it. Okay. So they're all the metrics are shipped at the same time. Right. So yeah. since it's so since the it's a ratio, ship. they're still the average is still right. So, so the reality is is that you could compromise something over time. <laughs> <laughs> if you were really patient, you could compromise it. So what happens? Especially now in, in our you know weird current world where supply chain stuff is getting all messed up and uh, you know certain microchips are um, drying up and we've got vendors that are switching parts um, to try to keep building stuff. What happens when a new switch comes out and, and it just happens to have you know the binning C part instead of the binning F part? And yep. the frequencies are a little different. Does that now show up entirely? Yeah, I know exactly. So let me let me answer it this way. Truthfully, all the switch vendors are using roughly roughly the same chipsets, Broadcom and, and, and all of that. So there are differences, slight differences then. Now, when they manufacture a brand new ones, we'll actually see the difference and the fingerprint happens to be so close. We know the difference with AI and machine learning and all of that. But let me take it a step further from a supply chain. Um, I'm trying to think how to say this. So imagine you purchase a device or 10,000 of those devices. Then when they get to the end state, the 10, 000, the 9,127 device is different than all the rest. We can, we, we can determine that. We can even take it a step further where you can analyze the components of an endpoint, meaning the internal workings of it, the components to understand what's there. So you now with layer one, you can start to understand was that compromised. <laughs> Lastly, Think about the gray market, and we 
you talk to a lot of CIOs that saying, hey, I cannot get Cisco switches. I'm, I can't get them from the manufacturer because they're not there. So I'm buying them gray market. And their concern is, am I buying or am I buying what I think I'm buying? So Hold again, on one second, Kurt. Hold on one second. Does everybody yeah. know what the gray market is? Everybody okay with that statement? Okay, I just want to make sure everybody's okay. If you don't know, catch me later and I'll explain the gray market. Yeah, so what, what we're seeing is there are devices that are being bought on the gray market, meaning not from the manufacturer, from a, a, an enterprise customer or someplace that are different. They've been modified. So, you know, we, we, we're even taking it a step further where we're working with vendors to have our agent deployed on their machine at inception or at creation. So now it's preventing from that supply chain manipulation. All great questions. And this is all the, again, going back to the path of least resistance. Anybody else got some questions? Uh, I, 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 have a, I have a question. There are, uh, I'm trying to think of the best way to articulate this, <laughs> a lot of different devices that exist. And my understanding is that you have gone through and fingerprinted just the malicious ones and maybe some known good ones. like. How are you going to keep up with like the signals fingerprinting? Uh, it doesn't really seem scalable. Uh, it's a great question. So, you know, if we look at an existing or existing knowledge base over a hundred million, that's based on all of the environments that we've seen. Uh, plus working with the specific vendors on getting the what we call gold standard of that. Plus what we're also doing is we have, there's an AI machine learning component uh, that's built, that's ultimately will generate about a million fingerprints per, per week, I think it is, based on all those signals. Now, I'm not gonna say that we've seen everything. We've seen a lot. We've seen the good and the bad, majority of the good. That's how we be able to tell the good versus the bad. But as new devices come out, yeah, we, 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 it may show up as uncategorized, but what it shows up as, as a new device that doesn't have a fingerprint. The beauty of is it, and here's a great example on this screen, as you can see multiple different devices in location, it shows the switch and the port. So there are times we can deploy layer one into a environment. And let's say there's, you know, two or 3% that are uncategorized. The good news is, I know where they are, I know what port they're plugged in, and it's just a factor of understanding what's there. So we're building this over time. Will we ever map the entire world? No, but that's the goal. And then I have a, I have a follow-up. So I watched some videos from your company's YouTube channel, and I was like looking at the dashboard, the same thing that, that I'm seeing here. And um, you had identified, um, I believe it was a Logitech keyboard as um, rubber ducky masquerading as a Logitech, a Logitech keyboard. Um, and so I was curious how that was working because I know you can go into the registry and pull connected peripheral information, things like that. Um, but I wasn't sure how you were actually getting the, like the actual voltage information uh, yeah. from those connected peripherals. And so I decided to look up your pending patents and um, saw that the majority of the language there on detecting malicious USB devices um, was around behavior and, and analysis, like for, for user behavior analysis. It's not it's, really layer one. I, I didn't see very much information about any of the layer one technology that you're referring to, just Oh, well, this is a rubber ducky. It's running these PowerShell commands, and you know we have this behavior analytics around these malicious actions that the device is doing. Um, so, so I want to know, I guess, how I, I like that. That's how most EDRs work. Um, so that's fine. But I want to know where's the layer one component there? Because it didn't seem readily apparent. 
It's a good question. So let me answer it this way. Behavioral analysis is traffic. We don't use any traffic. We just don't. We're not in line. There's no span, no tap. We just don't. So Gal, could you pull up the peripheral, the, the, the rubber ducky peripheral? Yeah, and just to, to add to that, what we say behavior of the device, don't confuse it with the behavior of what the device does. It's not about like the activity of the device. It's about the connectivity of the device, how the device communicates together with the endpoint that is connected to. And this is the behavior that we talk about. And that, that's, just, that's counter to like what I read though in, in your, your patent. So I, I can look, let's just, I understand and I've read that patent and it's a bunch of big words and all that, but truthfully, and you'll see here <laughs> now if you go to the, uh, if you go to the rubber ducky one, there is no beha traditional behavioral analysis as you think behavioral analysis. Behavioral behavior for us, as Gal mentioned, it's how it's interacting from an electronic signals perspective. Voltage, ampage, impedance, all of that. When that changes, that's how we know it's different. So go ahead, Gal. Yeah, and here, for example, and uh, maybe you saw it, but the rest know, uh, you can see like a device that looks at the operation system based on the vendor ID and product ID as a Microsoft keyboard. But actually we know to tell you by the fingerprint of the device, it's actually a rubber ducky. It's not about behavior because if I will put our agent to like to block devices, I can show you how the moment you plug it in, it's being blocked. It, it doesn't like even have the option to do something on the endpoint. And it, it's that fast because we are even below the device manager level because we block it before it's being connected and able to do something. And actually I prepared here several attack tools to show you and do we have some time? I can do it in five minutes and like how to show like how we can detect a keyboard for example and then if I will connect a keylogger, we will see the same keyboard appears on the operation system. But here on, the, uh, on our server, we will see it's totally different device. And if we have time, I can show it to you. Do we have time? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Question. Yeah, go ahead. If this is all for, for USB side, well, even, even network side, uh, if this is mostly based on voltage and impedance and those physical signals, what's to stop somebody from putting a potentiometer and a variable capacitor on the side of the device and just tuning it until it affects the device? You I mean, I suppose that device. I mean, I suppose you could. <laughs> I don't know. This is the ham radio guy in me thinking. Like, if I wanted to, if, if you're now saying, our, if I'm aware that I'm being monitored from a hardware perspective, those are not super hard things to spoof. To spoof, I get it. I mean, I think that there's a, there's a, there's a, I, I mean, yes, I agree with you. That's completely plausible. But I think you're getting into the world now of like, how far do you, how far do you go down this rabbit trail, right? Well, I'm just, I'm just saying in general, like if this, if this was a thing you were concerned about, I'm just thinking specifically voltage and those, those are fairly fixed signals, right? If I was looking at, you know, the FFT of frequency over time or something like that, then that would be, um, you know, a, a little harder to ask yeah. with. But both levels, it just not easy. <laughs> sure, I agree. I so, agree. so let me, yeah, I can address that. So look, everyone thinks ones and zeros is up and down and up and down. Truthfully, ones and zeros goes like this. There's noise, there's jitter. You use AI and machine learning to reduce the jitter. So when you talk about ham radios and all of that and increasing it, it's still not coming over the wire. You're trying to infect, inf <clears throat> affect it from the outside. That's jitter, that's noise. We can reduce the noise. And again, layer one gives you that information. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, could you throw something in there to actually affect it? It's a good question. Um, but in all of the analysis that we have done, we have not been distorted from that perspective from all of those electronic signals. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible, but again, it goes, goes back to what Robert said is, you know, I think anything's possible, 
But truthfully, what we're trying to prevent here or protect here is that path of least resistance and looking at the existence of a device and not what the device is doing. God, do you want to show that just, just some on the network side real quick in the interest of time? Again, how this looks from a spoofing perspective. Yeah, and here you see for as an example, like a Raspberry Pi that spoof the a Dell Mac address. Now think about NAC solutions, for example, what they are like Mac address driven. They will see this as a, you know, as a Dell computer. Now you can say we have the dot one X authentication, but it can easily be bypassed. I can easily buy a build Raspberry Pi that can bypass any dot one X authentication and can bypass the NAC, uh, NAC security. And this is how we can uh, like fill the data, the physical layering for detection to the NAC because we can tell the NAC what the device truly is. And tapping devices, Flanderbug device. Flanderbug device, just to show you, small device, basically it's tapping device, connected as many in the middle. And basically the attacker can see all the traffic that going through this device. It doesn't have any MAC address, totally transparent. Again, by the physical, physical fingerprint, we can detect this device is there because it has a unique fingerprint. And speaking about unmanaged switches, here, I have a simple unmanaged switch connected here, doesn't have any MAC address. Still, I, if I will run on the switch show MAC address table, I will see nothing here. We can still detect it because it has physical uh, existence on the port. I hope it makes it a bit clearer, like why the physical layer is important here. Now, we have like a few seconds. I just want to show you something very nice here that I have. Uh, one second, let me, okay. Okay, you can see my screen, I guess, and you can see my desk. So as you can see here, I have HP keyboard, okay? Now, let me connect the HP keyboard and let's see how it looks on my endpoint. And let me unplug the rubber ducky and I will connect the HP keyboard and let me pick my computer here. And here, where is the HP? Not here. And let's wait a second, okay. So you can see an HP keyboard was connected, right? And this is the vendor ID and product ID of the device. I already approved this device, so we can distinguish between another device. Now, what I have here, it's called the key clock. Basically, it's a key logger. Key logger, you can't detect it. You don't know it is there. It's a man in the middle attack for USB. Now, what I will do now, I will unplug the HP keyboard. And we plug the key logger. Now you can see, it starts to load and I wait for a white signal, a white LED. And this is the, okay, the green and then the white. Okay, I'm ready for the attack. What I will do, I will connect now the keyboard to this device. That's it, the LED turned off. Now, let's see how it looks like here. And say load, because I can I use it. No, I can't use it because it didn't connect yet. Okay. Ah, I didn't run it well, sorry. Let me, ah, okay. Take a second to spoof the vid and pin. Okay, you can see here, this is the approved device. That's why it appears as grayed out. It's not connected at the moment, but it's approved. That's why we'll keep it in the list. You can see this device looks at the operation system the same. It's the same vendor ID, same product ID. But based on the physical layer information, we can tell you it's totally different device. And in this case, it's the key clock, the key logger. This is that just to show you how device looked at the operation system the same way 
And if I open the device manager, I will see the same keyboard. EDR solution won't detect this device. And this is why it's important to detect it by physical air information. Because physical air information, like the physical air security, you can detect everything that is connected, all the men in the middle, every, you know exactly what device is connected. So nobody can spoof you, at least, we want to believe nobody, you know, spoofing the electrical characteristic is much more difficult than to spoof V and P of the device. So why didn't the device get detected when you first plugged it in? When I first plugged it in? Yeah, when you when you plugged in the, the spoof device, right? You plugged it in and there was no keyboard on the other side. Presumably because the device hadn't enumerated yet with the operating system, that it was waiting for the vendor ID from the keyboard on the other side. That makes sense. But if you're detecting this at the physical layer, why couldn't you detect the device as soon as it plugged in prior to an enumerator? Uh, uh, so the, the, the answer is it is detected. It was detected immediately. It takes several seconds to be updated on the UI because it reports to the server. But on the agent point, the device, I couldn't type. And you've seen, like I tried to type, I don't know if you've seen the camera, I couldn't type because it's being detected and being blocked immediately. And then it changed the vid speed. For me, I don't care about the vid speed. On the UI, we show it, it takes several seconds to update, but it's being detected immediately. It's interesting technology. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's uh, it's definitely something that we've not looked at before at this level, and it's an interesting concept of being able to try to map out the electronic signatures and and how to look at those pieces and be able to detect anomalous devices. So it's pretty cool. So, so where is this? I, when I see this, I think like someone. Yeah, like where you got that's it to go in the lower levels. Is that a yeah, like, where are you guys? I guess that's a good question. Like, where are you guys looking to where where have you guys can you talk about your market? Yeah, what's your market? There, there you go. I, yeah, I, I, I can, I, so I can talk about that. So again, I tie it back to risk adverse. Um, so we do a lot of work within the federal government, we do a lot of work in the financial services. We do a lot of work in the healthcare based on all of the types of devices that are being connected to the network because doctors do plug everything in to do their day jobs. We have a lot in manufacturing because of the OT space. It's hard to get visibility into OT. Um, retail also. So I, I think those would be the top right there. Um, you, you know, we've been deployed in a lot in international large global enterprises, overseas, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, our market is, is really, I don't like to say vertical, I like to say <clears throat> risk adverse. Okay, that's fair. Do you see yourself doing a lot of DOD work? Is that, is, I think that's probably where Jared and I are kind of leaning toward, like this is, this is some pretty heavy level stuff. And I, and I don't know what the, the cost point is or anything like that, but it, it seems to me like, this would be something that would be very DOD driven. Like you're, you're getting down to some nuts and bolts kind of stuff here. And I can't imagine that your average business, like I'm still trying to get people not to click on links and malicious emails, right? Oh. Or, and, not, and not use winter 2020 as their password. What you're talking about is like some pretty extreme level stuff. I mean, your customer base has got to be locked down solid before they were looking at layer one. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I mean, I yes, 100%. Look, if they don't have an IPS or IDS or EDR, I, yeah, they probably are going to start there first. But when we look at majority of the global financials, I mean, I'll just give you a use case. One of the use cases, one of them is spoofed MAC addresses. Their Forescout can't see spoofed MAC addresses. So they deployed us to, to aid in that use case. Others, one about when I talked about the micro segmentation, there is a lot of federal government, DOD being one of them, yes. Um, but you're right, it is more of the mature type security operations companies that, that, that we deal with. But we do have a lot of small 
hedge funds that have you know, a lot of assets under management that are still concerned or manufacturing because of their you know, critical infrastructure or, 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 or intellectual property, I should say, that is a, is a big problem, is, is, is insider threat. What's coming into my network? They want to have that visibility. Yeah, and that's not to say, and I don't mean to monopolize it, you guys chime in, but that's not to say that that this would not be interesting to any business, sure. right? I mean, like, there, and, and we we have fun with it because we pick it apart because that's what we do. Yeah, absolutely, I love it. But but um, but I, that's not to say that it's not interesting and valuable, to because I mean we can pick apart anything. Yeah. But layered, layered approach to the security model is always what we're looking at from a boots and, uh, belt and suspenders, as my CISO puts it. Yep. You know, I mean, there's always some, there's always a chink in the armor somewhere. So you need to layer in this security. And so this would be an interesting approach to it. Not one I've seen traditionally before. Yeah, and, 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 you know, I appreciate that, Robert. When you think about it, I mean, let's go back in the day when, you know, when SourceFire came out with IDS and IPS. It was awesome. It didn't exist before that. You know, why does it exist now? Because it's important to do to find all of that. Let's think about email security, not the proof points and the iron ports and, and all of that, but everything, the added layer on top of it, it didn't exist. Why does it exist? Because email is one of the biggest gaps that we have because people are clicking on links. Again, it goes back to that reactive approach where we develop solutions based on the challenges we face. What we've done is developed a solution because layer one has been left open. So in all of history of time, it's the same thing is technology has to catch up with the threats that are there. We may be ahead of the curve because, but I can tell you a lot of instances where hardware was the path of least resistance. Gotcha, makes sense. I've got a question. Yeah. Um, have you all been involved in any of the, uh, uh, financial processing sector, like I'm thinking, like like uh, like card readers, like um, like some of the different threat streams, like they're everywhere, like uh, yeah. on how to how to swipe like cards at like gas pumps. They put them yeah. in ATMs. You know, there's a lot of home based so, stuff out there. I'll give you a use case. Um, there's a a bank. Doesn't matter where in the world they are. That they had issues with their ATM machines. We now monitor ten thousand of their ATM machines. When we were deployed, we found a number that had been added hardware into it, like a card reader or something like that. We could extend that to palm scanners. We can extend that to anything. Again, once you fingerprint what the device looks like, any change to that will change that electronic signal, those electronic fingerprints. So yes, we do a lot of that. Interesting. Anybody else have any questions online? I got, I got one more. Yeah. Um, with, uh, okay, whenever this technology was coming out, I started seeing like some research where they were, um, uh, they were, they were trying to fingerprint different different machines and i don't know where that that those case studies started developing but uh they got down to the gpus where they could actually tell where what type of gpu you were using like what brand even though it's the same like you know the 3080 or a 3080 ti versus the 3080 ti they could actually tell the difference in the, the electrical signatures That's um, right. and they did that off the also with the monitors was that you all uh, no, well, actually, I don't know the answer to that. That may have been us, this technology, the way it started, however it started and used for a long time, they may have done that. But what we're doing is very similar where we're basically x-raying the internal components of a machine. So like I talked about the endpoints and God didn't even show this, but you can go on the endpoint side and look at all the components, what's inside the machine. So yes, it's, we're getting to that level of detail as we continue to evolve the solution. Are there any other companies in this space? So great question. To our knowledge, there is nobody else that is using layer one as a data source. To our knowledge, I'm not gonna say no because I have no idea, but 
in the research that we've done in the time that I've been here, we've never seen anybody else use layer one as a data source. And also, have you thought or considered crowdsourcing uh, fingerprints? Uh, oh, that's a great question. To increase fingerprints, you know? Yeah, like, crowdsourcing as, your fingerprint models. Yeah, a hacker in his basement comes up with some new device and Somebody else can we are totally open to that, but we would just have to <laughs> get the fingerprint. And truthfully, for us to get into the fingerprint, we have to see it within our solution itself. Because the, the there's no way they would be able to give us all of the different components because we're reading that. And it's processing with AI and machine learning and big data and all of that stuff. But yes, we would definitely entertain something like that. Yeah, I was just wondering, like, man, you got to have some trusted resources there because, man, I know yeah, we'll take it. We'll take the crowdsourcing from China. That'll be fine. Yeah, yeah it's like okay. Okay. And right that's now. the whole thing. Yeah, and, and truthfully, that's what we have to protect against. Is you know, someone could give us a bad device, knowing that they want to use it as an attack tool. So we, we it's a delicate. <laughs> You're talking to a pen tester, so uh, he was headed down that path well before you. Well, said I figured it. that because I'm looking in the room like he's asking because he has a specific use case in mind. <laughs> yeah, right. That's crazy. All hey, right, really. Go, go, ahead. go ahead. If there's no other questions, guys, I, I'm happy to answer. I mean, first off, I wanted to thank all of you for listening to us, and more importantly. I want to thank you for those questions because I don't ever expect easy questions. I like the tough questions because it shows that you guys are one thinking about this, trying to break it and figure out how to get around it. This is important to me. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Well, we really appreciate you guys coming in and really stepping up when we, when we, when we thought we were not going to have a meeting this week. So we really appreciate you guys stepping in and helping us out. So my pleasure. Um, if anybody else has any other questions, I can, Throw it in there if I can. Yeah, go ahead, Aaron. So yeah, I'm curious if you look into CrowdStrike Falcon device control and how does that compare to how your solution works? That was so, clearly so, an endpoint. This is also incorporating network, but go ahead. So from my and this is by this, I have to go back in the way back time machine because I it's been a while since I've looked at uh at, at CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike Falcon is all is and I could be wrong, is more behavioral analysis, meaning it's, it's analyzing what you've done in the past, taking a baseline and understanding the differences and changes moving forward. I could be wrong by that. But if that is like all behavioral based solutions, it's baselining the good and then understanding the, the changes in behavior. That's still traffic based. It's not. OK, so as a and I'll, and I'll just caveat that just real quick. As a as a Falcon customer, very correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's not entirely just behavioral based. There are malicious. I mean, it does use OSINT to be able to kind of go back and be able to say, okay, we know these are bad, this kind of thing. So it does do some of that portion as well. So I just want to say that it's not entirely just network based. There is there are behavioral based. There are some things that it tags into to the system that it does look for, but. At no point do I feel like it does any layer one yes. traffic so, analysis at that as, level. So I think you guys are clearly the lone player in that space. As a, if you're looking to be a potential customer customer before I left last company. Yeah. I uh, did ask the explicit question of how do we detect like a rubber ducky. Um, they did bring up CrowdStrike Falcon, uh, the CrowdStrike Falcon device control. And they did say, we asked about how do they detect and there was a mention of we see how much power is negotiated up to a USB port. Maybe they're dabbling. I'm, that's so, news to us. So that, depending on how you interpret that, that could still be traffic because the negotiation itself is going to be that's traffic. Fair. However, get into funniness there because technically you don't have your own sensor to read the voltage and stuff. You're trusting what the controller do. So, you know, there's six and one half dozen of the yeah, other. Yeah, that gets a little, but that's interesting. But yeah. as somebody, if you can control the device, you can also control the negotiation. 
sort of including how much power is the device going to require. But I mean, it's a lot harder to control yeah. the device. Yeah, that's that's, 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 that's the DOD no, stuff, man. That's the bar. No, I, yeah. I mean, I, I, we're getting into nation state stuff at this point. Exactly, but you you you'd be shocked at what we've seen, truthfully. But the you know, and again, I'm not. EDR is important. I, I'm not. Please don't mistake me picking on EDR because they use VIN and PID as it's not needed. My opinion is it's a defense in depth approach. ED, you need to have EDR on the machine to look for certain things. By adding layer one, it's looking for other things, basically trying to manipulate at lower than traffic. Yeah. That's my approach to, to, to security. Yeah, and I totally see this as an add-on feature. This is not the first thing you, like Like you're starting your security shop. This is not the first place you go. That's correct. Right? Uh, and that's not to suggest that you guys aren't valuable. Don't misunderstand me, but but you guys are definitely a, a further down the line kind of approach. And I, and, and I agree with that, Robert. That's why I said before, if I talk to a customer and they don't have EDR or ID, IPS, IPIDS, whatever, they don't have that, I'm going to actually say, hey, you know, and I'm honest with them. It says you need to start someplace else first, but come back to us. I don't want to I don't want to give them a solution or a technology, a data source that they may not be ready for. That's not what our job is here. Truthfully, it's we our goal is to help enterprises and we'll be honest with them. They need to start higher up the food chain first before they get into layer one. Yeah, my CISO would absolutely love you guys. I like the Mac integration. <laughs> I think that's a powerful integration. But oh, yeah, the Mac integration. The Mac integration point. Yeah. Or a more mature sore. Right. The action on that is important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Rob Perry would love this. Oh, hey, wait, 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 I, you know, <laughs> I, I'll say one last thing, and I'm sorry, man. I'm not late, but where we're going, it's pretty cool. So think of a security tools always do these alerts and stuff like this, but how about a security bot? where all of a sudden you get an email and say, hey, you have a new device that we've never seen before. Here is the device, here's the location. Do you want to take action? You press a button in that email and then it will either allow it or remove it. So there's, again, it's providing a greater efficiency in the team. So what we're going to is that artificial intelligence to have a bot that says A or B, what do you want to do? Yes or no? And give you those types of controls based on layer one. Again, that's where we're heading to, but it's pretty cool technology. All right, guys, we'll talk, we'll talk forever. <laughs> um, I, one more yeah. question. Shoot. Um, Shoot. I know you, what if it never, um, how often is it checking the signature if it stays plugged in? So if you're like manipulating a, a device that is like, I don't know, a, a badge reader or something that never loses connectivity, but you're implementing something else into that, um, how, how is it only pulling the signature data comparison when it initially gets plugged in or is it continuously monitored? Great question, great question. So constantly taking a fingerprint every time is something plugged in, plus we have the ability to, to pull the switches on a frequency that you want, like every minute, every hour, every two hours. So it is doing it however you wanna do it, on plug-in also, whatever frequency you set to pull the switch to grab the, the, the fingerprint. So is that a ton of traffic if you're doing it every minute? There's no traffic. Uh, well, Go ahead, go. yeah, uh, there is traffic, but oh. it's nothing. It's all like transferring metadata. That's all like text. Okay, metadata. that's what I'm saying. So it's just yeah. metadata. That's metadata. Yeah, okay. Correct. All right. Anybody else? They're here, man. Pair them up. All right. I got one more question. <laughs> so your company's patent takes a number of references inline devices, including trying to a very broad patent with a um, multi a multi protocol, multi um, multi I'll say proxy device, right? It's input, output. And then some kind of um, you know control signal in between. And I know you know some of your videos showed what looked like some kind of inline device as well that was um, silk screened with Cepio system. Do you actually make use of any inline hardware at the moment? God, you're gonna have to help me with that one, man. That that's way over. Yeah, the question. 
Can What's that? It's hard, to hear, it's hard to hear the question too. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of way in the back here. So you're, I, I noticed uh, when we were reading through some of your patents that you specifically had a very broad patent, um, one that seemed to be um, for inline security devices with a, an upstream port, a downstream port, and some kind of filtering mechanism in between regardless of, of medium, right? It seems seemed like it had uh, um, embodiments that uh, reference both Ethernet and USB. Um, in addition, one of your videos seemed to show an inline device with two Ethernet ports and silk screened on it, Cepio system. Um, so I'm wondering, do you actually make use of inline hardware devices for monitoring anywhere in your current product line? Oh no! Wait a minute. No. Like, yeah. But maybe, uh, and the company started. I don't know if you were with Kurt, but the company yeah. started with a hardware device. When, okay. like, I think oh, what, twenty sixteen. Twenty sixteen. Hardware device. Right. Like, and that's, that's and, the patent initially bought. Yeah. yeah. Not we, we, we we've gone far away from that. There is nothing that we need except read-only access to the switch for the network side or agent agentless recession based on the on the endpoint so we can grab the physical airbrace there is no nothing in the middle okay makes sense thanks great question though we i got one last one shoot i promise <laughs> no it's all good I, no this is a good no this is a good one um has any industrial control company tried to buy you all like siemens no <laughs> Um, <laughs> That's a can, can, can I can I broker that deal for you? <laughs> I just need ten percent. I promise. I, look, I'll I'll, I'll I'll I will comment to that because I I get that a lot. We are working with a lot of those companies out there to get those gold standard fingerprints. Um, you know, whether we get purchased or go IPO, the jury's still out. I had my feelings two years ago when I first started, which has completely changed. And I'll explain why, you know, um, I don't know if anybody know who Lane Bess is, the astronaut that went up to, with Michael Strahan, but also the guy that started Palo Alto and Zscaler. He is now the chairman of our board. And I had an interesting conversation with him but three weeks ago at Oresco, first time I ever met him. And I asked him, I said, why? Why did you, why did you do this? You could have done anything. And his comment to me is, the technology that you guys have, I've never seen before. I've seen EDR, I've seen NDR, I've seen XDR, I've seen firewalls, I've seen all of that. Would you guys are do something different? And the data that you guys collect based on those fingerprints that you are having, 100 million, get to 200 million, 300 million, that is so critical. And that's what gets a company to IPO. Whether we get there, I don't know. And this isn't about where are we going or something like that, but it just shows the value of layer one. And that's really why I brought that up. Cool. So, all right, I'm done. I said that before and now I'm really done. <laughs> all right, well, thank you guys so much for being here tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you for uh, stepping in like you did. Um, and we will go ahead and close out our meeting for this evening. We've got a couple of comments, uh, amazing presentations. So, uh, so I think you guys can see some of the comments. So really appreciate it. I will go ahead and get this posted on the YouTube website. Uh, I will I will make sure to share that with Ken so he can share that back out. Well, Ken, you already know what this website is. So. Yeah, um, it's, you know, my only ask, just let us let us know where you share, when you share it and stuff like this, because I'd love to see it again as well. Yeah, absolutely. We'll do it. And so I'll make sure that you're aware of it, make sure that we get that shared back out to you. Awesome. And uh, it, and just for your information, info at RoanokeInfoSec.com. Okay. Or RoanokeInfoSec.com. RoanokeInfoSec.com. That has all of our information. So if you don't awesome. hear from me soon enough, just hit me up on that. Just info at RoanokeInfoSec.com. I'll make sure that I get you back and get the information that you need. But uh, great presentation tonight. Really appreciate it. Turned out well. And uh, if anybody has any questions or concerns or feedback, talk to one of the other folks because I don't want to talk to them. So um <laughs> Anyway, no, just kidding. So you guys, thank you so much. And we will see you guys later. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Great meeting y'all. Take care. Thanks, everybody.